Look, if you're going to invest in Bitcoin, a short time horizon is four years, a mid time horizon is 10 years. The right time horizon is forever. You know, Warren Buffett said, you know, if you wouldn't hold it for 10 years, you shouldn't hold it for 10 minutes. So if you look at the course of four years, no one's ever lost money over four years holding Bitcoin. And, and if you look at, you know, uh, our experience, we started buying it at $10,000 and now it's up by a factor of four. So, so given the right time horizon, you're fine. So it's a blessing and a curse. The blessing is it makes it the most exciting, interesting thing in the financial universe everywhere in the world. And, and the curse is it can induce anxiety for people that have a short t attention span or, or are focused on a narrow time horizon. I think that um, there's a lot of dynamics here. If you look at the entire uh, crypto ecosystem, you, you have, um, you have a, a, a set of regulatory uncertainty especially regulatory uncertainty around stable coins and crypto tokens uh, and whether or not they're securities. And that creates a little bit of, of un anxiety. You have a lot of leverage offshore, right? You have a lot of crypto exchanges that can trade with up to 20x leverage. And those crypto exchanges have many, many tokens that are cross collateralized. And between them and the DeFi exchanges, you can get much higher than 20x leverage. So that's the second source of volatility. The crypto markets are almost designed to encourage volatility. And that creates kind of a love-hate relationship between the, the crypto ecosystem and the Bitcoin hodlers. The Bitcoin hodlers are holding for, you know, a decade, you know, and, and sometimes for a hundred years and sometimes for a thousand years. And yet you've got fast money hedge funds that have a tax incentive, a huge amount of leverage, and massive volatility, but you have two totally different investment mentalities here. And uh, when they come together, the result is you've got, in my opinion, the world's least risky asset to hold over the next century called Bitcoin. And you've got the world's most volatile fast money market, you know, called crypto. And they're both conjoined, joined at the hip for better or for worse in the year 2022. I, I feel like it's consolidating this level. This is a great entry point for institutional investors. I talk, to, I talk to high net worth individuals, family offices, public company executives, private company owners, and they watch Bitcoin run up in 2021. And there are a lot of people that would be afraid to own it if it was going up 400% a year. But if they're staring at it and it's 40% off the all-time high and it's consolidating and they see that it's being embraced by people like Bill Miller, by very well-respected investors. It's being embraced by the regulators. It's being embraced by senators and congressmen and public investors and public companies. They're looking at this as like a good entry point. I, I'd be remiss not to make a more important point, which is what's really going on here at a macro level is Inflation, the CPI headline inflation is 7%. Look at the Turkish lira, it's collapsing. The peso is collapsing. So there's a volatility story for a conventional investor in Manhattan that's got a portfolio of equities. But 75% of the world can't buy the S&P index. They're in Africa, Asia, South America, and it, and if they've got their assets in banks, they're gonna have them seized. They can't buy the equity. So the real story here is digital property that solves a problem that 8 billion people face. Yeah, we're gonna buy more. Our, you know, we're, we're buying more with our cash flows. We've adopted a Bitcoin standard. That means that when we generate cash, we sweep it into Bitcoin. We've been generating, you know, anywhere from 70 to $100 million of cash flow. So we will also uh, buy Bitcoin with debt. We bought Bitcoin with $1.7 billion worth of convertible debt. Uh, we bought Bitcoin with a $500 million senior secured note that we pay six and an eighth percent interest on. We also issued a billion dollars worth of equity at the market and we converted it all into Bitcoin. So combinations of cash flow, equity, debt, potentially through other partnerships. The 100K party.
it was uh, the fall like uh, of 2020, and I think Bitcoin was trading at 15,000. And, and uh, you know, John Vallis roped me in. He said, will you host the 100K party? And I said, well, sure, I will. There was no doubt in their mind the party's coming quite soon. I, I was just amazed at the confidence of Bitcoiners. Um, I don't have a, a, a price target for when it's gonna happen. What I learned is laser focus. Stuff takes time. I'm comfortable with us working through this year over year. I don't, I don't need instant overnight success. There's a, a, a profound shared appreciation that uh, digital assets are the future of the financial industry and the United States needs to lead. And I've been pretty impressed at the support in the Senate and Congress from the administration and from regulators all around the world for this entire crypto economy. And in the use case as digital property, I think that uh, the regulatory treatment is pretty clear. If you sell it at a profit, you'll owe capital gains on it, just like if you sold any other property. I think that with regard to the cryptocurrencies, the stable coins like Tether and Circle, they're gonna be regulated as currencies. Clearly the administration wants to see FDIC approved and insured banks issue them. So I think that, uh, that we're gonna see uh, the banking sector enter into the stable coin market um, I think that many other cryptos are deemed as securities and will be deemed as securities and they're going to be regulated as securities. I think that the marketplace is waiting to see what those expectations will be. And, and I think it's pretty clear that um, the writing is on the wall with regard to crypto exchanges, right? The SEC wants them to be to abide by the principles and the rules of national securities exchanges. And they've said that in the spot ETF denial letter that they wrote uh, and on several occasions. So I think the regulation is coming to the exchanges. I think regulation is coming to security to to the crypto security tokens. I think it's I think that with regard to stable coins, this is going to be a good thing. Right now the the stable coin market is maybe hundred and seventy billion dollars all in. It's grown dramatically, but the truth is there's a demand for trillions of dollars of U.S. dollar stable coins. And the reason that that entire market hasn't grown by an order of magnitude is because companies like Amazon and Microsoft and government agencies aren't going to move billions of dollars of stable coins around unless they feel comfortable that Treasury and the administration endorses them. And when we see FDIC approved banks, when you see a JP Morgan issue a stable coin, you may see a trillion dollars worth of that. And let me just characterize the, the entire movement. This is a rotation from an entrepreneurial driven industry to an institutionally driven industry. And we're sitting at this point where we're crossing the chasm. And the question is, which, in, which entrepreneurs will be institutionalized and come public and, and get the appropriate regulatory licenses? Which existing institutions will choose to enter the market? Which banks, like the Silvergate banks of the world, will enter the market? And then um, there will be a shakeout. And obviously, 6,500 crypto currencies are not going to be around here in a decade. You're going to see many of these things go away as the industry shakes out and as it matures.